Good but we're. It, it's it's terrible weather with somewhere in Kelly. Yeah. It was reminding me how we when we first met you, Stace, and um, you were gonna come pick up Romy or something, and then and Summer came to work, and she goes, "Oh, is that lady coming to pick up whatever we called him at the time?" I called him Frosty or something, mm -hmm. and I said, "Oh no, she thinks there's a storm." <laughs> Like we look on the weather, there's like some storm like 900 miles away out in the Pacific. <laughs> Summer's like, is this the storm? <laughs> so that was the only reason I said I didn't want you to drive up here. Of course I want you to come up here. And of course I want to go to dinner at Norwood's. I think we should do a prank on Chase because Chase wants to find a sugar mama. We can do a little episode where we can pretend like Stacy's the sugar mama we found him. All right, George won't like that, but we, we won't tell him. Like Put that on my secret channel. Summer wants me to get a secret channel where I, you know. An uh, underground training channel. Oh, what would there be, just though? An underground Kelly channel. Oh, what could it be, though? Just you mean just, like, put my concert stuff and stuff on there? Yeah. Because people don't understand my show. I mean, uh, they make it a point to tell me, too. And when I, mean, I say I completely understand... If you knew Kelly, you would know that means I don't understand it. <laughs> so if you are the recipient of Kelly saying, I completely understand, please know that that means I don't understand at all. <laughs> um, anyway, girl, so it's really, really wet. Anyway, this girl that trains service dogs, I, I really got a really good compliment. And I honestly, I mean, I, I love things. And I told Summer, I think, you know, part of my joy in life is having things happen that I say, I, I didn't see that coming. And so this girl, I, I mean, I really had no clue she watched my videos. In fact, I, you know, something she had said to me before, I, I, I wasn't sure how to interpret it. I wasn't sure whether it was, and I mean, obviously I didn't think it was condescending or I would have unfriended her. I just, I wasn't sure what she meant by what she said. But apparently what she watches the show to get ideas. So she likes the videos. Not, I love your training. Of, um, well, I always tell Summer, though, if if the only thing I did, you know, was inspire people to come up with new ideas, because there are no original ideas, this is what James Patterson told me, you know, everything's just a combination of other ideas, which is really what I'm doing. I would never sit there and say my method. I mean, I'm using Jim and Phyllis's method. I've just modified it because I've been left alone with, you know, an e-call or half a winter park, and you know, they're dogs, you know, so that's where it just kind of developed, but, you know, but that's what this girl said. She watches it to get ideas. So now the pressure's on to come up with even more ideas. The black whale technique. There's no, it's, it's not, you know, and I wouldn't even say that to me, you know, because the first time I go on somebody's YouTube and I hear them saying, with my method, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why that bothers me. I Why guess because you know everybody else copies everybody else and you don't do that. Well, what do you mean? I just got through saying I'm just using Jim and Phyllis's method. So if that's not copying, yeah, it's, it's not even copying. It's you've turned it into your own. You got your own techniques in there. Well, yeah. I mean, I do have my own techniques and stuff, but you know, I don't sit there and say my method. I don't know why that mm -hmm. bothers me. When people say that, I think it's kind of OMG. Self-centered? Get... Well, I, I just don't think it's... I don't know. I think the people that I know that really train dogs, that are really serious professionals, say things like, this is what it takes a dog to do, to get a dog to do this and this and this. You know or I do this to get them to do this. They don't say, yeah, I guess, I, I don't know. I don't know anything. You met me, Stacy, in the part of my life where I don't know anything. I got to the point where I knew everything, yes, everything. Shortly after that, I realized I knew absolutely nothing. And that's where I'm just, I'm on that plateau. Happily plateauing. Uh, summer's making me snacks for the weekend because I don't want to go to the store because it's so 
uh, terrible outside. And then someone was like trying to make me go to the store. And I said, oh, do you want me to creaming down the road in this weather? No way. Have you ever made Rice Krispies? With like marshmallows and um, freaking um, Rice Krispie. Uh, it's that cereal. I just thought I was clearly not reading the script. Look of utter shock on my face. She's asking this of the person that taught her how to make cookies and frosting no, I've from never made scratch. Them, I don't like them. Yet she believes somehow Rice Krispie treats. I did see this really, really good documentary. I'm going to go back and find it because I don't know if you're in, and I'm really not into Vietnam War at all. It, we've been so inundated with it in my generation. But it was this guy, and they were caught in some fox. It's a, it's a really, really, and he wasn't religious at all. He just, he had like this experience when he went there. And he survived against all odds. And he's, they have a name for guys like that in this world, and they're, they, they call them real men. Uh, but when he left for Vietnam, he wouldn't let the wife drive him to the airport because he just wanted to do the emotional, you know, detachment right then. And she said, I'll pray for you and send Rice Krispie squares. And he said, don't forget the Rice Krispie squares. Yeah. You know, because he really didn't believe in God. And then he had this, you know, I mean, they were trapped in a foxhole. They were surrounded. They, they, you know, they would dig these things underground. It was a very, very guerrilla war. You know, there was booby traps. There was people hiding underground. There was, you know what I mean? It's not like the war they have now. The, you know, that's why camo was always green before now. Now, cap, now army is, uh, camo is khaki because they're fighting a war in the desert. The reason it was green was because they were fighting a war in a jungle. Anyway, there was like eight of these guys from two different groups. This guy had two guys of his own, and the other, there was a, uh, a captain or something that had three guys, and they were trapped and surrounded. These people had a tank on top of the foxhole trying to cave it in, trying to kill them, throwing grenades in there, shooting flamethrowers in there, you know, and they kept fighting, and finally... For some reason, air support couldn't get in there, and they cut off all their supply. They were pouring gasoline into the air holes. I mean, you know, there, it really was surviving against all odds. And then somehow they came in there and started bombing them, and there was like eight of them got out, and they made an agreement. If somebody goes down, they, they stay where they lay because everybody can't keep going back for everybody. That was the agreement. You stay where you lay. You fall everybody else just keeps moving. And I mean, again, these guys are taught to, you know, if this is who's in command, then that's what you do. So they're going. So this guy, the one that said, you know, if you fall, yeah, if you, if you fall, you stay where you lay, gets shot. He falls down. He says, I'm looking around, waiting for these guys to pick me up. And then I remember that I said, you know, you stay where you lay. And I don't know, just somehow, oh, I know. So now he's laying on his back. He's completely wounded. He can't get up. He can't do anything. He's surrounded by, you know, Viet Cong is what they called him. And, and these guys were, you know, they, you know, I don't know as if they were as brutal as ISIS, but they were very, very determined to kill their enemy. And, and who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? You know what I mean? If, if someone comes to your country and say, yeah, yeah, people have a lot of motivation to fight. Anyway, so somehow then he has this out-of-body kind of experience and when he's looking up I guess these bombers are flying over and this guy tips his wings and he said that gave him the strength and somehow he got up or he saw God I think he actually thought he saw God you know and I mean when he went home he had a lot of naysayers you know and he called his wife and 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 I guess there was some big thing on the news because back then that's all you really had. There was no internet. There was no nothing. They would come on with this like, and Stacey will remember this, this like CBS I think, da 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 You know, and it was like there was a huge battle and, and honestly it's terrible that I can't remember what it was. And I don't think it was the Tet Offensive. Maybe it was. And it was on the news and it, you know, these guys from whatever unit it was uh, were trapped there so they knew, the father-in-law had already knew that he was going there and Somehow, you know, they said eight guys got out. And they had a couple of them on the news. And, oh, I gotta show you this. I mean, when they used to have these guys on the news back then, oh, it was painful. I mean, it was almost like they, 
people weren't really that good in front of the camera, average people at all. And it was almost like they're, they almost looked like they had Stockholm Syndrome or something, the way they're talking. Not this guy, but anyway. So then somehow, uh, somebody saw a picture of him, the, you know, this girl's husband in the newspaper and they went, because that's all you had. There was no internet. There was no, let's ring up Vietnam and see if, you know, we can get in touch with them. And anyway, but he survived and called home and said, I was saved. And his wife said, I know, I saw you on the thing. And he said, no, I was saved by God. And she said, you know, what kind of head wound does this guy have? You know, but he's still alive. And, and, the, and the documentary was him going back to um, Vietnam and they were there, they were there in Ho Chi Minh City because it's all communist now. We lost, we lost. We lost the war to communism, so now it's all communism. So some guy's there from Denmark and starts talking to him and yeah, this guy's a real man. And then the guy starts saying, yes, you know, see how much better it is. And the guy says, oh no, 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 no. Uh, let, me, let me let you know how this goes. This, this is, they've made this as a, you know, thing for you to see, for you to perceive. But if you go outside of town, you know, it's it's sheer gruesome people living on dirt floor poverty of a country. You know what I mean? It's not. I, and I, there's people that I could ask Breck. I can ask Breck because Breck and James went to Vietnam. I, I, it's it's a, it's not a first world country. It's it's got to be at least second world. You know what Stacy's like, who cares? Um, but, alright girl, we're gonna go make, uh, cupcakes. Bye girl.